Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Leadership Loft. I am your host, Lakeisha C. Brooks, and I have an amazing special guest today. As you know, we have been interviewing some influential leaders that are going to be joining us for the Diversity Blueprint 2024 conference. And I have the pleasure of kicking off today's session with our kickoff speaker. And Nelson, can you please introduce yourself? Of course, Lakeisha. Thank you so much for the invite. It's a pleasure to be here, everybody. Uh, my name is Nelson Santiago. I'm the Chief Learning Officer and, and Founder of Learning DNA, which is an organization that helps other organizations, small business, uh, to be able to be more productive when it comes to people development and to increase productivity and retention through diversity and talent development initiatives. Awesome. I love that. You know, I am one of the few people that I've even heard of that that merges talent management and diversity. But to hear that there's other people doing this is fantastic. So talk to us. Why did you decide to merge diversity and talent management, especially because diversity is typically siloed? It's typically its own department or it's typically just do some trainings and check a box. Why did you decide to also go down the route of merging those two areas together? So, Lakeisha, as you know, uh, probably better than me, the fact that those two go hand in hand, like you, you know, I, I understand that each function has their purpose, right? So we do have to celebrate the uniqueness of both, but we cannot just separate them to the point that they're not talking to each other, right? It's like having the two hands and and the, the, the proverbial, the right hand doesn't know the left is doing vice versa, right? So when you look at those things, they have to go hand in hand because I've seen it so many times, Lakeisha, and I know you have to, when an organization starts doing some diversity initiatives, and then on the other side, they start doing talent development, talent management initiatives, and they're not, they're contradicting each other. You know, at right. times they, they end up wasting money, wasting time. Uh, and that's why sometimes the, the, the employees don't see the value of any of them. Because since they're so separate, they're pulling each other away from the from the purpose, from the you know from the the objectives, from the KPIs of the organization. They don't see the purpose together. And this is what I tell people: it's like you have to you have to think individualistic, but with a with a, a global or uh, a holistic approach to it, right? Okay. Um, so you think you think globally and you execute tactically right so uh but they have to they have to be hand in hand because the more the more we can see the link between each other then we can identify the purpose right and and purposeful initiatives uh are what drives the force and drives retention absolutely so one of the things that um our organization have been working on is trying to get organization to understand that diversity architecture is a framework in mm -hmm. It should be in the DNA and it should be an integral part of your organization. How do you work with organizations to get them to see that the check on the box of a diversity or the compliance training is not enough? How do you convince an organization that, hey, this has to be part of every part of your organization from your sales to your talent to your policies? What are some strategies that you use? So one of the first ones I try to tackle, Lakeisha, and you know that at times it's not as easy or it's easier said than done. Uh, it's to it's to identify organizational objectives, right? Uh, it's to have to have those initi initiatives be tied to the business itself, not to an activity. I see a lot of organizations wanting to do the the monthly celebrations or want to do the uh, you know the. The, the, the yearly training or, or you know, mm -hmm. every every so often or having conversations, which don't get me wrong, all those are great, but they still are attached to the activity stigma, which is not attached to the to the bigger picture. Right. So when you start looking at um, an organization really conveying the fact that they want to use this diversity uh, or use the uh, talent development, talent management to improve productivity, to improve profitability, to improve retention, to lower turnover, and, and actually being able to do so, not talking about it, but getting it to the point that their evaluation strategy 
actually gets to to showing the the goal and showing successes um i think that's one of the first things i like to tackle because you know uh, you know how the flavor of the week you know doesn't necessarily work in organizations right you see it all the time you see it in psychometric assessments you see it in and you know, uh, in trainings, you see it in initiatives, you see it in in in, in the uh, very much buzzword driven uh, activity based you know initiatives where where they don't see longevity, and that's what that's what organizations or the workforces want to see. They want to see that for whatever reason that we're doing the things that we do, right? For the initiatives that we do, the policies that we put in place the objectives we have in mind, uh, they're looking for longevity, right? They're looking for this is going to be sustainable. This is going to be scalable. And and once you answer no to those, you know, are these initiatives scalable? No. Are they sustainable? No. So why are we doing it, right? So there's no linkage to purpose. Uh, so I think that that's one of the first things I like to tackle, making sure that the objectives, the why, right? If you look at, you know, any leadership guru out there, you know, one that comes to mind, it's, you know, I'm going to give the, uh, the a shout out to, you know, Simon Sinek that says, start, start, start with why. Right. Yeah. And a lot, yeah. a lot of authors base themselves with that. Start with the why, because the why communicates intentionality versus the what and the how just tells you how to do things and what needs to be done. Right. So I think that let's start with the why. And explain to our workforce that the things that we do is not for the flavor of the week. It's not because it's a trend out there because uh, you can start seeing some numbers go up and down because of that. So long story short, that's what I that's what right. I try to tackle first. No, it, 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 it's funny you said that because I always start with the why. I always talk about Simon Sinek. I always say, read the book, which I have, yeah. or listen to the TED Talk because it, it's, it really is so important. You have to start, yeah. why are we doing the things that we do? Mm -hmm. And you yep. talked about some really good stuff um, when it comes to tying it to metrics and things like that and making sure that there's a purpose for any of this stuff as well. So you probably heard, just like all of us in the DEI space, that a lot of organizations are getting backlash for doing diversity work, or they say DEIs now die, that sort of thing as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I've, heard, <laughs> I've heard a lot of that as I've well. Heard it. Mm. Right. So what have, what are some of the remedies that you could suggest to organizations who are saying, hey, like maybe we should get rid of our stuff, or is it really dying, or is it going to impact my organization? What are some remedies or what are some advice you can give to those organizations who are just like, I don't, I don't know if we should still do this because now everyone is ending it. What do you say to those organizations? So, you know, I, I, I look at, again, looking at the why. Why are we doing things? Um, and if it's an organization that brought DEI just to check the box and, um, and really didn't put any thought process, there's two ways of doing it. It's identifying, you know what? Yeah, we just did it for the flavor of the week. This is not going to help us either way. Um, you know, if you got to do away with it, you got to do away with it. But not, not without asking yourself, uh, the question of have we have we really tried everything we could to make this successful, right? Because you know, at times you got to start with self accountability and come back. And probably some organizations are going to be have to start with, hey, I'm sorry, <laughs> we thought we did this well, we didn't. Uh, we didn't start the right way, right? We didn't start with a blueprint, right? We didn't. Hence, hence the talk that we're doing now. We didn't start with a blueprint. We really didn't. Didn't uh, thought we didn't bring the right players to this. Uh, we started with a check in the box, and it was hard for us to get out of that check in the box mind mindset. So again, it's like you know, some organizations have had like you know, some organizations that I work with. I said, you need this. You need DE and I or DEIB, right? Don't let's not forget that belonging. Right. You know, from it. <laughs> You know, I said, you you probably need, you do need that belonging. You do need that inclusion in your culture. Uh, let's move away. Let's move beyond the diversity, the D and the and the E. Let's focus on the I and the B, because uh, that's where you take that, that the next level in your organization. You're, you know, I've seen a lot of organizations that are well diverse. You know, I think, you know, last organization that I dealt with, they had over 50 countries represented in the organization, Lakeisha, but um, there was no inclusion, right? So diversity, you know, although, yeah, this is what, this is the first, that's how we prop the door open, but it really, uh, it doesn't, doesn't open it all the way. Mm -hmm. And I've seen organizations that had to go back and say, you know what, workforce people, 
uh, we didn't do this right, and we want to do it right this time, right? Not doing away with it, but really coming back and saying, hey, it was not, it's not the initiative itself. It was us. Mm-hmm. We, we didn't know how to apply this. We made a mistake. Uh, we need to go to back to the drawing board, maybe bring some people that really know what they're talking about to help us, you know, build that, build that plan for the future. But uh, for those people that are thinking, Hey, maybe it's time to let it go. Um, I tell them this, it's like, did you really let go of a workout plan because you're not losing weight or can you look in, or can you look internally saying that, uh, maybe I'm not working, working hard enough on this. Right. Uh, it's maybe not, it's, it might not be necessarily the diet is that probably I'm, I'm having too many, too many, uh, free days, you know, right. or, or, you know, diet break, break days. So I think that, you know, always look internally first, identify, did I do, did we do as an organization, everything that we should have done to make this sustainable and scalable and scalable. Right. Um, and if we didn't, uh, is, is it the initiative itself or should we go back to the drawing board and maybe, you know, uh, start from scratch, even though that at times that's tough to do. But if it's really going to uh, help the organization move the needle forward, I think it's it's a good risk to take. Absolutely. And, and I love that we talked about accountability because you mm-hmm. have to take that accountability. You know, we can say mm-hmm. activities didn't work, this didn't work. But at the same that's time, right. leadership are those that the right. stakeholders have to say, what did we do wrong? Correct. Did we focus more on activities and check boxes mm-hmm. versus strategy um, with, and blueprints as well, which is a different mindset and a different approach to diversity as well. So I want to talk about diversity leaders like yourself and, and me and the things that we deal with. What advice would you give to those diversity leaders who are struggling? Because we've seen a lot of diversity leaders lose their jobs. We've seen a lot of them quit with burnout. We've seen a lot of them have secondhand trauma. We've seen a lot of them that have had their jobs for three years or whatnot, and then and then they're told this isn't working. How do you continue to encourage those diversity leaders like yourself that are internal, that are dealing with the struggles of resistance or pigeonholed? How do you help coach those leaders? That's a really good question, Lakeisha. And of course, everything is going to be dependent on the situation that, that they're going you know, through. Um, but this is what I would typically tell those folks to to keep the head up. Um, you know, at times, you know, you can't you can't control anything outside of yourself. But so if an organization comes back and say, you know what, uh, is is not going to work for us, um, it's okay. It's okay. You know, this is not for everybody. And what I mean by that is, you know, for for uh, diversity to be successful, uh, people need to be all in. This is not a partial thing, right? And at times, you know, I find myself, you know, like you said, working as a diversity leader in an organization, not getting the support I needed uh, necessarily to be successful. So it's not necessarily a me thing. It could be an us thing, right? Because, mm-hmm. you know, the equation is always you plus me equals us. Is not me equals us or you, right? So I cannot remove myself from the equation and they cannot remove themselves from the equation. But basically what I say is the more the more the diversity officers or leaders can find partners within the organization. And what I mean by this is let's try, let's try, because I know that one of the biggest things that we had to struggle with as diversity leaders was to prove our worth within an organization, right? It's like from day one, uh, we are placed under a microscope oh, yeah. uh, to make sure that we provide results. And the and the issue is that, you know, diversity is like soft skills development. It's nothing that it happens overnight, right? It's not, it's not an instant gratification thing. And unfortunate, a lot of organizations wants to see that instant result, yeah. instant gratification. Uh, this is a, a delayed gratification, but the way we can show instant gratification is to partner with the with the uh with the operations of the organization or find ourselves a partner that while the long wins are waited for because again it's a long it's it's a it's a progressive approach right it's a um it's a pervasive appro- approach right it, it, it mingles and, and goes into other areas of the business but if we can see where can we find the fastest wins, where can we actually see the impact of diversity? Let's say that, for example, if we find the operations of the organization where that's where typically you see the instant gratification, right? right. Financial, income, product, production, you can start seeing those numbers 
immediately. So let's say that the diversity leader partners with a manager uh, that is struggling with retention or turnover, a team that is struggling with turnover because of whatever reason. And let's say that diversity, inclusion, belonging, again, not necessarily only the diversity, but the inclusion and belonging portion. We can do things within that team that will, you know, in, encourage them to continue to stay with the with the business, you know, improving their quality of work and, you know, improving their quality of, of life within the business itself, within their team. Maybe partnering with HR to recruit people that they might need that representation. They might need that, you know, uh, group of people that partake in that. Or even if they are, I see there's a lot of manufacturing. If you see that minority group well represented during those uh, those small teams, how do you show them now that you value their their diversity and how do you, you know, uh, make them feel like they belong in the organization? Right. So starting with those, because now you can start seeing a spike in productivity uh, versus, you know, the entire organization. Lakeisha, and I got to tell you something. And this is a mistake that I made myself at one point in time. And I had to realize this. Uh, a lot of diversity leaders want to want to a want to see a global impact immediately, and and we need to start you know looking at small. We need to you know we need to look at small wins that lead into a bigger win. Um, you know, a lot of us want to start with this company wide impact, and that takes time. Right. And you know, when we come in wanting a a a company-wide impact that could potentially take us six, eight, 12 months to achieve. You have that C-suite team wanting, it, wanting to see immediate results. That is not the right approach, right? Uh, we want to, again, like I said, you want to think big, execute small, uh, because you know the more little wins that you can start showing, a progressive, progressive impact to the organization, I think that's going to justify a little bit better our the need to have a person like ourselves in here, right? That is not all about race. It's not all about gender. It's not all about color, right? So it's how do we actually are helping the organization grow from the get-go, from the moment we arrive, and then see that progressive success, those wins throughout instead of just sitting here and waiting for a big win. Absolutely. You always start with small wins. You know, that's mm -hmm. one of the areas of change management is exactly. focus on those small wins. And I love that you said that it's not just about gender or race or color, because those are most areas that people feel like, oh, when we talk about diversity, oh, this sucks. Why is it based on color? Mm -hmm. And it's like, exactly. it's beyond that as well. And so what do you do to challenge that that notion that, oh, you know, we, we are fine. We have enough black people. or Oh, we have enough women. How do you challenge that mindset to say, hey, it's not just about that. Diversity is so much more diverse than just those first dimensions that people talk about. What are some of the strategies you do you use to challenge that idea? So it's funny you mentioned that, Lakeisha, because you know the question that I ask and 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 I, the statement that I say to that, I, I could potentially come across a little bit harsh when I say it to organizations because they're like, well, you know, we're let's take that organization that I work with that had fifty countries represented. And they came back and say, Nelson, we're a very diverse organization. We got 50 countries represented. And I'm like, and, I, and typically my answer to that is, okay, so you have a poster. Now what? <laughs> now what? Right? You have the poster. Now what? What do you do with that, with that, you know, uniqueness that are bringing in 50 countries? What do you do with that different mindset, different skill set, right? And I tell people that the beauty of diversity is not what is represented in the outside, is what people bring in the inside, right? And typically, the inside is affected by the outside, and and I cannot, I cannot <clears throat> say no to that. Like a you know a Hispanic straight, you know, kind of like if you really look at it, white, white Hispanic straight man. Because of the fact that I've grown like such, my biases. My upbringing, my culture, my education has crafted the way I think today, right? And that's what is beautiful out of diversity. It's not the fact that I'm Hispanic. It's not the fact that I am straight. It's not the fact that I am, you know, white, if you want to put it that way. It's the fact that because of all those things, 
I have a unique mindset and a unique decision-making process, which is the one that is going to bring to your table to say, Lakeisha, have you thought of this? And you might have not thought of that because you are not in my shoes. You did not live the life that I lived. You did not. And it doesn't matter if I was raised in the U.S., raised in Puerto Rico. It does affect the way I think. So I tell organizations, okay, so once you have that, yeah, you get enough black people, you get enough, you know, white, you know, you get enough whatever women. What are you doing with that? Okay, what are you truly saying and conveying to your organization? Another example, like Keisha, I had, you know, or another organization that said, Nelson, you know, we got 60% of our C-suite team is females. And I'm like, well, good on you. That's great. Uh, so, so what? What, what's what's your point behind this? Is it the poster again, or are you actually doing something about it? And so let me ask you something. How did all those C-suite uh, female members get there? Well, we hired them. Okay. So you don't have a succession plan. You don't have a progressive there to tell the, the remainder, the rest of your female population, um, you have just conveyed the fact that in order for them to become a C-suite member, they got to leave. They got to go somewhere else because you don't grow that here. So how are you telling the rest of your female population that they can also sit in these chairs versus you hiring this skill set from outside? You know, where's your succession plan? Where's your developmental plan for people? And this is why, Lakeisha, I like to put two and two together. Mm -hmm. I like to put it two and two together because um, I told that person, it's like, I'm glad that you get 60% females in your C-suite team, but you have just conveyed the information. If you don't have a way for the rest of the, uh, of the female uh, groups in your organization, a, a path to sit in those chairs, you have just told them that the only way to become a C-suite member is to go somewhere else where they're appreciated. You didn't grow it inside. You didn't, you didn't create that career pathing for them to say, if I want to become the COO, I have the ability to do so and the path to get there because the organization has created that for me. Um, so again, I, I I have a lot of questions that I ask, Lakeisha. You know, for those people, I was like, well, we got enough of this. It's like, so why, you know, what what did it make you stop? You know, why are you stopping? What 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 success measures have you discovered that made you say we were enough? We're good to go. We are represented. That's fine. If representation is what you were looking for, then you hit you hit the mark. But what are you doing with that? Show me the KPIs. This is why it's so good mm -hmm. to go back to the objectives and the business, right? Show me the KPIs that this things that you have done has helped you achieve. Show me that. Show me your retention numbers. Show me your turnover. Show me your internal progression and, and, and development numbers. Uh, show me your productivity numbers, right? So again, once I start asking that, I can use those numbers to clearly identify that they have not, they're not there. Uh, and then they can make a choice. Either they, let's do it again. Let's do it the, the the real way, the way we should have done it from the beginning. Or we can just say enough is enough and cut it and, and, and see what the future has for us, right? There's a risk with everything. Absolutely. <clears throat> and you, of course, have worked with my team. You know, we love data, too. We love connecting ROI and data mm -hmm. and numbers. Yep. But like you said, a lot of organizations, because they came into it with more of a performative or activities focus, mm -hmm. when you ask about data and numbers and all those things and tied into diversity and talent management, it's like, wait, what? Can we just do a training and call it a day? It's like, yeah, well, we can evaluate that too. <laughs> we yeah, can, we can give you data on that. Yep. Yeah, we can get data on that too. So yep. um, I want to talk about, you said some organizations have diversity, right? I, I've worked mm -hmm. in organizations where I'm like, the diversity is great, but the belonging isn't there. People mm -hmm. feel a separation between corporate and frontline staff. What do you say to those organizations who just throw out a lot of letters, right? We do doing D-E-I-B. I've even had J just throwing it out there and have no idea about what that means for the organization. Mm -hmm. How do you pull those companies back who just want to put every single letter in there because it just seems like this is what we should be doing? Yep. So again, I go back to objectives, Lakeisha, because most of the time they don't. It's very reactive mindset. You know, a lot of organizations are very reactive, um, especially if it's an organization that are, is blooming with growth. 
you know, a lot of organizations, after you go through 250 employees about, that's the number I'm putting in there. Like if an organization reaches 250 employees and they don't have the process, the processes in place, don't have the actual um, um, procedures to be able to be successful, they're only focused on growth. And then they, and once they get to the 500, 1,000 employees, it's a lot of backtracking if you don't if you don't have it in place right so a lot of organizations that come to me and they are in that stage in their dei journey right everything is very much very reactive <clears throat> we have you know d-i-e-i b and keep adding right we get all that i always go back to show me show me that you're successful you know don't tell me what you're doing tell me what the impact has been of what you have done uh, cause I tell them, I said, don't, don't ever confuse. And I, I heard this from Denzel Washington, a video not too, too long ago. And Denzel says, don't confuse, don't confuse movement with progress. Mm. Just because you have movement doesn't mean you have progress. You know, you could be running in a treadmill and go nowhere, you know, for hours and, and still go nowhere. You, you're still in the same position. Right. So I tell people, I said, maybe you have had some movement in your in your DEI journey, but show me the progress. Right, what have you actually have achieved? What ha are these initiatives really impacting? So I go always go back to the data. Data never lies, right? Some people say, well, it can be manipulated, but it never lies, right? You know, uh, so when you get data, uh, the numbers are there, and if you and if and if organizations and most out of none. Uh, Lakeisha, they cannot produce. Yeah. You know, every time, you know, most of these organizations that want to show, throw out there, are oh, we doing this, 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 and that? I go, like, that's great. Show me. Show me that you have actually achieved something with those things. Not just check the box, check the box, check the box. So most of the time, the way I say that is show me. And most, most out of none, you can tell that those initiatives have not yielded any positive results in the business itself. There were more feel good type of initiatives than uh, it, the true impact to the organization, right? So I don't even have to say anything. I just ask for data and then I go, um, that it's not there. The impact's not there. So what are we doing from now on? You got choices to make, right? Because, you know, most of us fall into this fallacy of, of success, um, you know, uh, and, and that's that's the dangerous part. The dangerous part is not believing that you are, you know, that you're doing something to be successful. The dangerous part is falling in the fallacy that you are actually achieving success. Absolutely. So what are your thoughts on organizations now adding justice to their their work because they feel like it's it's a, it's a social thing we have to do. I know that some companies are, are going away from it and some are like leaning into it. What are your thoughts on adding justice to their work? So <clears throat> I, th I think that one of the toughest things that I have to say, which is really, really tough to, it's a tough pillow to, pill to swallow, um, is, is shifting the paradigm of how we show worth and 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 let me explain real quick because again um, i'm a true believer i don't i don't necessarily need anybody's approval to to prove that i'm i'm worth it right but when it comes to the function itself not an individual worth but the function the function's worth you know at times we we don't necessarily know as dei leaders how to show the worth that we bring, right? The value of what we bring to the table. Uh, and a lot of us, you know, cling, you know, cling into uh, race, again, the outside. A lot of us even make the mistake of clinging to that because, you know, yeah. it is tied up to a social stigma. Therefore, we have to hold on to, to the outside, right? We're, we need to look at what value we bring from the inside, showing that, hey, like, for example, I, I always give the example of having uh, I, I was working with this team and I had a lady, a part of the team that was handicapped. And we were brainstorming. A lot of great ideas came up. Right. And when we're when we're about to hone into the last decision making. We decided to 
make sure that we're including everybody. So we told her, Rachel, what do you think? You know, any feedback, any ideas on this? And she's like, have you thought of this? I'm not necessarily going to say what she said, but she's like, have you thought of this? And we realized that we made a mistake. Mm -hmm. We realized that we should have brought her in from the beginning. You know, after spending so many hours, so many thought processes, so many, we realized that because we were not in her shoes, we didn't see the world the same way she did. Therefore, we missed that perception. Uh, so that's what this brings to the table. Having a culture of inclusion, have a, uh, a, a culture of belonging. And when I tell people this, it's like I tell managers this, Lakeisha, it's like inclusion is not necessarily celebrating Hispanic American month for me to feel included in the organization. For me, inclusion is if we're in a meeting and you make sure that everybody's heard, that you hear everybody out, you heard me, and you're actually valuing and validating what I bring to the table. That for me is inclusion. It's not necessarily, well, you know what? We need another Hispanic um, uh, uh, thought process. Uh, where's Nelson at? Bring Nelson in. <laughs> that is not how it's done. It's to make sure that we value every person in the organization. We value everybody in the team. And the way that we do that is not by just activities, but it's a mindset. It's a change in mindset, change in paradigm, right? Diversity is not an activity. It's a mindset that you bring in. And people need to understand the diversity, although I'm going to have my own my own individual diversity journey, but it's all diversity, individual diversity journeys under one diversity purpose, right? right? And that's, I think, what we need to identify in an organization. It's not easy. It's easier said than done, of course. And I don't want to sound any simplistic by any means in anything that I'm saying, but what I'm bring, what I what I mean by this is like you don't you're not meant to do this alone, right? It's like you know I tell people leadership or diversity is not meant to be done in solitude. It's not it's not meant to be done in solitude. So partner with people that know about this stuff. Uh, partner with people that know what they're talking about. Uh, experts in the field, right? We don't we don't just lean on anybody to achieve goals. Uh, we lean into people that bring that into the table. How to hire appropriately, right? I think that's one of the biggest things too. It's on the hiring process. We need to be more inclusive mm -hmm. in the hiring process. We make a lot of mistakes you know, in the hiring process, and then we want to you know, blame it on diversity. But um, but those are my two cents. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. And as I stated, Nelson will be our kickoff speaker for the diversity blueprint. And so, Nelson, can you give people just a little taste of what you're going to present and share? Because everyone knows it's case study, so it won't be a lot of methodology and all that, which is great. We love that. But it's going to be some proven, some some data, <laughs> some work that Nelson has done. So can you give them just a little taste of what you're going to present in August? Yes, of course. And right now, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run uh, all the participants through our process. You know, how do we uh, go through an organization that was struggling with with the EIB and now they're trying to reinvent themselves around it? Uh, and basically what the conversation we've been having, Lakeisha, we're going to be talking about an organization that started, started their diversity journey, realized that they did not do it the proper way, uh, just by very reactive way and how they were uh, able to turn, turn the ship around, uh, identify goals. And I'm going to run through the process of how we were able to do so in a successful manner. Awesome. Thank you so much. Any last minute words before I turn the conversation and talk about some cool stuff? So any last minute strategic DEIB stuff that you want our listeners and viewers to know? So what I want, I want to, I want everybody to take a different approach, stand back real quick. <clears throat> and I want you to view a way of uh, diversity, inclusion, and belonging depoliticized. I want you to try to see if you can depoliticize the EIB because I think we see too much in social media, too so, you know, so much in, in, the, uh, in the media per se, right? In the news you see in social media and everything that really uh, pulls us away from what DEIB should be. Um, you know, it should not be just at the outside appearance, but more of what, what mindset, what different uh, thought process and decision making process people are bringing because of the nature of the diversity, right? So I want you to step back 
and try as much as you can to depoliticize DEIB. And I can guarantee you, you're going to see, you're going to see diversity from a different lens. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. So many may not know that Nelson is a veteran and he's mm -hmm. passionate about military services. So thank you for your service. And I actually thank just you. talked to two veterans yesterday. What was the most exciting thing about being a veteran and what was the coolest place you got to live? So, so I was in the Coast Guard. So in the Coast Guard, you don't live outside of the U.S. per se. We have different stations. So I think the coolest, one of the coolest things that I have to say that I did in the service, um, you know, when I was in law enforcement and drug interdiction, I was able to stop, stop tons of drugs from coming into the United States and hurting our youth, hurting our people. Uh, so I think that um, there was no, no bigger satisfaction to see that much, that much content in drugs uh, prevent it from coming to our streets, preventing, you know, preventing them from coming to our, to our shores and, and to our youth. So that was a very, very strong feeling of, uh, of success and achievement. Right. And I think that one of the coolest places I got to go to in the Coast Guard, believe it or not, I travel a lot doing international training. And I think that one of the coolest places I was able to go because it was so different from culture itself. Uh, my culture was in Kazakhstan. Oh, I was able to see the real Kazakhstan, not from, you know, Borat or some of those movies yeah. that you out there. It was such a cool place to be. The food was amazing. People were so, you know, welcoming. So uh, it, it was an amazing place. I will go back in a heartbeat. Awesome. So that's a trip you're planning to do with your wife? Maybe. Well, I don't know. I don't know if my wife would like that. You know, <laughs> I, I like it because of history, right? The right. whole history that happens there, but definitely to the area. We'd we'll love to go back to that a part of Asia. Yes. Awesome. Beautiful. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Nelson, for sharing your insight you. on strategic diversity work. I think our listeners and our viewers got a good insight on how they should effectively approach diversity work from a more strategic approach and less of a performative and an activity approach. So right. thank everyone for being here with us at the Leadership Loft. Make sure you join us on August 21st for the Diversity Blueprint 2024. And until next time, have a wonderful day. Thank you so Take much. Care, thank you.